Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I am super excited today uh, to be with Joseph Gonzalez. I'm Dr. Nadia Butawi, and welcome to the Lunchtime Healthcare Tech Show, where we show entrepreneurs tips and tricks to grow their business. Welcome to the show, Joseph. Hey, thank you, Miss Nadia. You know, you know, um, I like to make the disclaimer as well. To me, you are one amazing person. Your your content is super, super, super way above what most put out there. And it's just I'm honored to be on your show. I love what you do. Um, there's so much more that I can say about you, but you know yes. how I start the shows, right? I'm Joseph Thank Gonzalez. You. Thanks a get lot. Up, get going Absolutely. And get it done so and yeah. Boom. <laughs> Boom. So Joseph for the audience is a certified yeah. Calbee coach and a consultant. He specializes in optimizing and aligning high performing teams. He's also a member of the board of the Florida Speakers Associations. Again, welcome to the show, Joseph. Thank you, Nadia. All those, you're making me sound too much more than what I am. I'm just a regular Joe trying to change the world via my motivational, my inspirational, and bringing equality to the world. As we know, in today's day and age, there's a lot of factors, a lot of variables being tossed at everybody. And everybody tends to grasp or basically understand factors and, and issues a little different. And they accept what they want and they discard what they don't. But some people get caught up in that little uncertain space. So and my goal is to make sure that everybody understands their value, understands their worth, and believes in themselves every single day. Because if, we, if anybody watches what I put out there, they know what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring it every day. And I'm going to make sure that Absolutely. everybody brings. And I personally look forward to his daily two-minute motivational videos to get the day started. It's released very early in the morning for early rises, but you can watch it later in the day. But that's one thing that's part of my morning routine, I have to say. So if you <laughs> haven't followed Joseph for inspiration, for inclusivity, for diversity, and for team building for your company. Yeah. So that's if you'd what... like, and before we get to the show, if you'd like to touch base with Joseph, after uh, the show, there is his email, joseph at inthegamegroup.com, or through his LinkedIn uh, profile. You can send him a direct message through there, too. And I can be reached by a direct message on LinkedIn, too. So are we ready for this? We were born ready, Nadia. You know how it goes. Awesome. I'm ready to, go that I'm ready is, to add value. That is awesome. Yeah, so a successful business is not an individual effort. It's a team effort. And that is especially true for startups <clears throat> because there is no way around it. You have to optimize your team in order to, to reach your full potential. And for that, every member of your team, they need to be on top of their game. This is why building high-performing teams, it's not just about hiring people, but it's about building a whole team. So today we're going to share some tips and tricks with you on how to do that with uh, Joseph. So Joseph, to get us started, you've worked with a lot of companies, helping them optimize their, their teams uh, for high performance. What is the number one thing that you see in very high performing teams that is common? Well, the, the most common that I see, whether... When you talk about high-performing teams, as you know, there's a lot of variables that go into high-performing teams. But where I see a lot of organizations fall short is what I would call the after-action plan. Let's say most organizations will say, no, my teams perform at the optimum levels or elite levels mm -hmm. or high levels, and they'll bring all this data to me. And then, yeah, in numbers and in data, dude, it looks phenomenal. That's mm -hmm. great. I mean, it's beautiful that, that your teams are performing at the yeah. levels that you feel they're performing. But what did you do after you gathered that data? Did mm -hmm. you sit down with each individual team member and ask them, how did they participate? Were they included? Mm -hmm. Were they engaged? Were yeah. they motivated? Were they challenged? Were they driven? And what I found is they'll hand the projects to the same two or three members, put them as the project manager, and mm -hmm. then they'll go through and find the, the results that they feel they could achieve, mm -hmm. but never actually understood what 
what disengagement or who did not participate yeah. in the overall team building event or environment that they were looking for. Yeah. So, yeah, the data results, they look beautiful. But you lost four or five team members along the process. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that troubles me because then it's not a team environment. It's not a high-performing team. It's two mm -hmm. or three people dictating how the projects get finished or how the team mm -hmm. develops without without um, being in tune with the other members of the team. And to me, that's not a high-performing team. Those are some of the basic concepts that I've yeah. seen. And that's where I've come in with my strategies, my ideas, and my exercises to try to bring more engagement and more involvement and more inclusivity like we know. That's awesome. So, yeah, you mentioned engagement. So what are the key things to reignite that engagement within a team that is not performing at, at its best? The, the engagement is huge. And as and you know, the, the basic the basic realm of a team is trust. We, we yeah. spoke about that before yeah. we got on it. But before we get to that, the, how can I re-engage or make these individuals engaged? I'll, let's say I'm the guy that's been chosen to run all the projects. I'm mm -hmm. the, the head guy, the highest yeah. performer, the guy that has everything going for him. And yeah. I grab a project and I finish the first project. Yeah. If I'm the guy in charge. What, I, what my expectations and the way I set myself up is yeah. once we finish the project, I'll sit down with each team member mm -hmm. and I'll have a cheat sheet or a check sheet with them. And I'll tell them, how did you do in this? Write down how you felt throughout the whole process. Yeah. Write down where you came in and you contributed to the whole process. Was yeah. I clear? Was I communicative? Mm -hmm. Was I creative? Did I do all these things to fit your bill, not me? Was I yeah. open up to you to fit this bill? And once mm -hmm. I see the checklist, then I'll immediately understand where I fell short by serving mm -hmm. my team members. Yeah. Or they didn't, they, I didn't meet their needs during the project. We finished the project. Like everybody uses the return on investment or whatever they want to yeah. use. It's yeah, great right. on, on numbers. Yeah, but so me, the, K I, the KPIs are there, but the team... The team There's is no not cohesiveness. Yeah, it's not there. Hmm. Do no, you think how often do you see that in teams? In today's landscape? Yes. Mm -hmm. A huge amount of times. I can't tell okay. you the percentages right off the bat, but yeah. most of the teams now, based on the fact that you got mm -hmm. like we had discussed the hybrid, the remote coming back in. Exactly. Now that this, the disengagement is huge. Why? Because they're accustomed to doing things differently and on their own. Mm -hmm. using all these 100 meetings a day, which is a waste of time on the Zoom. And then now they're coming back to the personable touch, the having yeah. to interact every day, the having to get, get to recreate that environment again. And that's where the disconnect is being mm -hmm. really felt in organizations throughout. And that's one of the biggest challenges that organizations have today while rebuilding or recreating their teams once again. Like so do you have then. yeah? So do you have any tips on how to re-engage the team when they move back from the pure, you know, remote to a hybrid to an in-person environment? My first team, my first tip is to sit with the immediate members of your team and start mm -hmm. coming up. Let everybody have a seat at the table. Yeah. What I mean by a seat at the table is let's put everybody on the level playing field. Forget about mm -hmm. your title. Forget about your position. Forget yeah. about your compensation. Let's all sit at the table and let's all throw ideas on, on in the middle of the table and come up with a better concept or a better solution to what we want to do to re-engage again. Mm -hmm. Once I have an idea of what Nadia wants mm -hmm. to do, mm -hmm. how she goes about her processes, what ideas she brings to the table, once Nadia has an idea of how I operate, what I expect, what I want to do, now we start building off of what we come together in as a team to be better to gain better knowledge, to understand, to communicate, to be, be a cohesive team, to be more engaging, to be more inclusive. And while everybody has the same seat at the table, everybody's going to feel that they are part of the huge picture of building out your team. So my point here, have it been an introvert myself? I know it's uh, it's not easy to believe that I'm an introvert, but I am. <laughs> no, 75%, no. a really good percentage of people are introverts. So if you tell them, you put them on the spotlight in a meeting room and say, hey, come up with ideas, you're gonna miss out on 50, at least 50% 50 of your workforce. 
not contributed. So how would you be inclusive to different types of personalities? Because if you are within a room at the table and different personalities, you're going to have the loudest person in the room maybe skewing the, the results in mm -hmm. one way. So uh, what would you, how would you suggest to be inclusive for introverts like me? You know, and that, I love what you just said because that, that question that you're asking is what I confront most of the time because you do have those outspoken and then you mm -hmm. do have the quiet ones. The quiet so ones, my, yeah. You know, you see my headline in, in LinkedIn, get up, get going and get it done. Boom. When I come in and I start just, they visualize me what, before they meet me. They visualize, well, this guy's a professional or this. They, in their own mindset, mm -hmm. they have a different picture of what they're going to confront yeah. when I come in person. Because yeah. as soon as I walk in, I'll start laughing, having fun, fantastic, mm -hmm. and engaging with everybody, each and every individual on the team, whether it be one, two, three, four, five, whatever the number. I'll mm -hmm. tap them on the shoulder. Hey, it's great seeing you. We're going to have a mm -hmm. great time. So right from the start, I have to set the tone to calm everybody down and yep. let them be free to be themselves. Key, key to me is I want Nadia to be free to be herself mm -hmm. because that's going to bring out the best in Nadia. Every moment that I interact with Nadia, I know based on my interaction with Nadia every single time, how she is, what mm -hmm. her expectations are of me as the leader and what my expectations are of her. And she understands that trust that she feels safe and trusted while I'm in the room. So they'll That's open right. up. How about whenever there is a differential in, in power? Let's say you have the manager or the, you know, the senior person in the room and people may hold back because of some sort of fear. So how do you handle that? Do you keep them all in one room or do you talk to them separately to gain as There's, much insight? That's great as well. There's different factors that I use. When we bring on a senior person, the first mm -hmm. thing that I tell any organization that mm -hmm. wants to bring me in, obviously I'm an outsider. Yeah. So the biggest, biggest, biggest factor that I confront sometimes is full transparency. Why? Yeah. Because I'm going to walk into a gentleman that's or a young lady that's been a CEO for, let's say, 15, 20 years in this organization. Mm -hmm. They're bringing out Joe, the regular Joe guy comes in. And I start asking the questions that I need to be answered. Yeah. One of the first things that I tell everybody, Nadia, is you're going to bring me in. Did you already do your due diligence on me? Did you see what I do? Yeah. Who referred you to me? Are you okay with providing me with all the answers that I need to do? And mm -hmm. number one, I will not be muzzled by you or by anybody in this organization. If I can't get in the trenches and ask mm -hmm. the janitor, the CEO, yeah the VP, whatever titles they might have, yeah. the mm -hmm. questions that I need so that I can bring about the desired results that you want me to achieve, yeah. then you got the wrong guy. I see. Because so you get I, you the expectations from the get-go. Right. They have their expectations. I understand them, and mm -hmm. I'll read through them, and I great, I have mine as well. Because right. what, what I found, Nadia, is a lot of the older school leadership styles that are still um, in corporate America, will not be willing to provide me with full transparency. And I understand, mm -hmm. I understand, believe me, I'm up to speed with what they're trying to say, but at the same time, you've gotten it to this point for a reason. You're calling yeah. me for a reason. You You're have bringing a me in for a reason. I can help you get to where you wanna go, but I need you to help me help mm -hmm. you get to where you wanna go. So- That's awesome. That One is, of the things, mm -hmm. and the, my main thing, and I'm, I like humor. I use humor a lot. So I'm a funny guy. I like to have fun. I like to soften up the, the, the space that I'm in. And I mm -hmm. just like to, to be completely open and transparent about what my expectations are and what their expectations are. I like yeah. to set it all straight from the beginning because in no way, shape, or form do I ever expect or do I ever want anybody to say Joseph came in and did perform based on what mm -hmm. he promised. No, I'm not going to yeah. say much. I want to over deliver and over perform based on what I promised you that I was going to do. Because I want you to understand that your return on your investment on me mm -hmm. was way over what your expectations are of me. Mm -hmm. 
That's so, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so Joseph, for companies that are startups or they have this chance that they are early enough that they can build it, right? What are the pillars of high-performing teams that they should take into account? The quick, short answer, hire the right people. Okay. Hire yeah. the right people. How do you find out that they're the right people? I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that was my next question. How do you find out if it's the right <laughs> fit? You know, everybody, and you, it's funny, I have a program called The Right Fit Hiring with my mm -hmm. Colby assessments, and that'll let me know where, how, how they operate on a daily basis. So if, mm -hmm. I, if I bring you in and I run the Colby assessment, and I like to make this disclaimer as well, the Myers and Briggs and the DISC programs and all those programs, they're okay, they're fascinating, and there's nothing wrong with them. I chose a different path mm -hmm. because I want to know how when Adia, Nadia gets up every morning, I want to know how she operates. I mm -hmm. want to see what her strengths are, where I can place her, where her, where she will align with her roles and responsibilities, or do I have to adjust her mm -hmm. roles and responsibilities so that she can perform at that elite level like she is meant to be? Because let's say you're, an, you're a healthcare, a stem cell expert, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, genetics, if, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So if I put you to wash dishes, that's not your that's strength. Not, yeah, that's not, mm-hmm. So how long before you come back and you say, hey, dude, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm burnt out. Or I'm stressed out. This is driving me crazy. I got a million dishes here and it's driving me insane. Mm -hmm. So you're going to well, does it Does it out. take into account the personalities in, on top of the, their skill set? The, the basis of the Colby assessment is to bring about, optimize what the three, just to, I'm going to track back a little bit. There's three parts of the mind. Uh -huh. your cognitive, which is your learned behaviors, your mm -hmm. affective, which is yep. your personality traits, mm -hmm. and your cognitive, which are the way you operate, the way you take action, or your instinctive yeah. strengths. Over time, the only one that will never change is your conation or your cognitive strength. So mm -hmm. based on the Colby assessment, it falls under four different categories. You, it, it'll score you based on the four different categories. Your fact finder, your follow through, your quick start and your implementer based on your numeric scores. Mm -hmm. I'll know exactly how you're going to operate every single day. So if I hand you a project, I already yeah. know if Nadia likes to research, how long you're going to spend or you're going to spend most of your time research, 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 research yeah. before you start the project. You start implementing your, yeah, the starting. So, so having imagine, a complementary team, like the creative, maybe the researcher to do the, ideation, searching for solutions, the implementer, that's the go-to, you <laughs> right. know, operations guy or person, and so on. So I'll give you my, my example. My scores are eight, seven, two, three. So what that tells me <laughs> is that I like to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. I like to do research. I like structure. Same here. <laughs> I like structure, and I like everything to flow. My implementer I have a vision to where it wants to go, but mm -hmm. I need help taking it there yeah. from somebody that has a higher vision score than myself mm -hmm. to terminate, to finish the project. So if I was to tell you that I'm going to put you and I like the research. So once they hand us a project, we're going to spend most of the time doing what? We're going to do a research. lot of research. We're going to come up with a lot so, of ideas, but we need somebody so, to make them happen. Boom. So that's exactly where, based on the mm -hmm. scores, I'll find other team members that have different strengths than I do and mm -hmm. we'll implement them into the team so that we can do the research, pass it on to the fact finder, put mm -hmm. this guy to quick start it, and then put the implementer to finish it. Yeah. It'll be well, a cohesive awesome. team so mm -hmm. that we can come up with a finished product or a finished project without... That's avoiding my main concern here is avoiding the three pillars that everybody goes through stress anxiety and burnout yeah because and burnout is a real thing because if you are stuck in right. one of those three pillars because maybe you need a, a complementary skill set exactly so perhaps exactly. you need to recruit and be proactive that this is the type of you know team member that i need at this particular stage right so going back to the right fit hiring We'll run that assessment, the right fit hires, what it's mm -hmm. called. It's exactly what it's called. And I'll know exactly where to place this individual. If my open role is washing dishes and he has no, no idea of how to wash dishes, 
but that's the only role available. I have multiple options. I can realign the role, assign him with different responsibilities, mm -hmm. or I can force him there and have him burn out. So what's the chances of, of yeah, sustainability over sense. time? Yeah, of course. So, and it's going to cost me more money to hire somebody else. It's going to cost me more money to train. It's going to, the turnover rate's going to skyrocket and I'm mm -hmm. going to lose out to the competition because I know the competition is thriving using my system. Yeah, yeah. How about you touched on, you know, the turnaround and I have to touch on the, um, what's called the great resignation. Resignation. Between, yeah. So what's your take on that? How does that relate to having the right performing teams or the right environment for these t team members to thrive in as opposed to jumping ship? What, what's your take on the, uh, the, the source of the great resignation? I'll, I'll give you some data. In the last five years, organizations have lost $233 billion based oh, on my. turnover. That's the great resignation. And, you know, I'm not no economist or anything like that, yeah. but get ready for the next wave. You know why? Because most of the leaders have mm -hmm. not bought into the people over profit system. They're still in the profits over people, which yeah. in turn, it's going to cause another, another great another. resignation. And until they don't get out of that old leadership style that they still continue to implement, yeah. it's going to continue to happen. So, and I think, your, yeah, and I think to add to your point, especially with the Gen Zers, they think different. They have the option of making money without being employed through online, and they are very resourceful. Right. So it's going to take a lot to, they can make 100000 plus a year doing unconventional you know, what we right. thought it's a nine to five. And they're okay with that because the, the values, value them free that they value other stuff that companies, they need to think about that if they are to sustain their, uh, their, um, their pipeline for quality candidates or employees. And you know, what, one of the things that I tell the CEOs and the presidents and the VPs, whoever I meet with or whoever wants to sit down with me, I tell them, when was the last time you walked the halls and asked people how they feel? When was it? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And I, and I understand Jeff Bessels has a million employees. He can't get to everybody. But you know what, what will happen? If he walks down the hall and asks one, two, three, or four, or five people, wherever it's he's It's a good representation moment, of the culture. And it's going to start the, the chain effect. Oh, mm -hmm. Jeff Bessels came and asked us how we were doing. This one will tell this one, this one will tell this one. And you know what that does? It provides them an opportunity to actually speak with somebody, yeah. the owner, in this case, that has the power to understand what they're trying to say. So when I walk into the organization, most CEOs will tell us, dude, I don't walk the hallways in 30 years. <laughs> yeah, so they, they're out of touch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk and about the other thing, Yeah, that reminds me of when we did like organizational uh, leadership. One thing that really, uh, really uh, stuck with me is the, the reward system. So you have, you know, you get a job, you have some st sort of reward, which is like benefits and so on. The third part that is missing in a lot, it's called valence, which means what do I value? What's valuable for me? So for somebody, it could be the monetary reward. Others, it could be the flexibility. Others, it could be that potential or the ability to do two days from home, three days in the office, and so on. And I think have incorporating that balance in the reward system is critical, especially with going back from right. pure hybrid, system, like remote to hybrid to in person. Exactly, and and it goes back to what I was saying. How many actually? How many uh, leaders actually take the time to get to know the people? What's important yeah. to them? Some mm -hmm. people, like you said, they might think the finances is important. Some people might think two days at home is more important than mm -hmm. another dollar or two an hour. Some exactly. people might think the flexibility to come and go as they please is important. For but me, in research, there? flexibility was huge because exactly. I was the primary caregiver. And exactly. I'm the first one on an emergency call if something happens to my kids. So having that flexibility and my employer being okay with that was a huge plus for me. So. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Everybody, each and once they get the understanding that we're all individuals and we all have to meet different needs, you'll get a better feel for your workforce. 
It's Absolutely. the only way, the only way you will capture your workplace is by what? Capturing Talking your to- workforce first. Mm-hmm. You have to capture yeah. your workforce. Because Absolutely. if you, if all these people talk about bottom line, you know who the bottom line is? It's, it's your, your employees. It's your employees. You take care of your employees and they take care of business. Richard Branson from Virgin Yeah, Atlantic. exactly. That's what he, yeah, exactly. That, he's one of my favorite, you know, leaders. And, and, that, and he, he's broke, right? He's broke because he takes care of him first. No. No, he's, he's not. Money <laughs> because he takes care of his people. He does. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And that too, goes back to the, uh, the retention. Because when yeah, people exactly. feel valued, when they feel heard, that they will stay. And again, one another of Richard Branson's quotes is that train your people so they can leave, but treat them right, so, they will stay. They will stay. Boom. That's a mic drop. <laughs> I was and I was waiting for your tagline for the past 30 minutes. <laughs> boom. That's a mic drop because you know what? If every organization would operate that it's way, so we true. wouldn't even be talking about the great resignation. And the other thing is, um, there's a lot of especially in this like talent war nowadays because there is so much demand and so many people jumping ship or changing jobs Mm -hmm. is there's always this you know recruitment bonus how about you do a retention bonus instead it's (laughs) more cost effective for the company to have a retention bonus to reward the people who were loyal you know what where's the you, you know where's the biggest drawback of that retention bonus because they'll say, no, we'll give you a $5,000 sign-on bonus if you stay here six months. A person that's only interested in funds or finances is going to take that bonus. And six months later, they're already strategizing from day one how they can leave as yeah. soon as they turn six months. So to me, that's ineffective, number yeah. one. And to me, that's, that's completely disrespectful to your current talent that's yeah. within your organization. They can do it better. And they can exactly. go up to the next level. Why don't you, you know, promote? Right. Instead, instead of, of giving, instead of giving that sign-on bonus to that new hire, mm-hmm. you, it's okay to give. But why don't you give it to your current talent mm-hmm. that's there and tell them, hey, look, you know, you've done a great job. We've been watching you, even Step though we up, haven't told yeah, you anything. To the next level. Mm-hmm. There you go. And on top of you getting a new title or position, here's a little bonus for you: five thousand. Yeah. Let's say mm-hmm. in February or June or may instead of waiting till the end of the year and giving them a one percent raise which gives them 50 cents an hour more i recall somebody without naming the organization that she changed jobs because she got like less than 0.2 percent raise which was very offensive for her like within two months she changed jobs because of that and she probably got a better salary somewhere else any, so, any and every, right. Go ahead. All the organizations, if you look on any other job boards, everybody's asking for talent and everybody's paying top dollar for talent. So as an organization, mm-hmm. why don't you understand the effect that that's having on your organization and step up for your people? Exactly. Why is it so, why is it so hard to step up for your current talent? Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you bring in outside talent and pay them more than what the people are making in your own organization now. And then it will take, in best case scenario, three months for them to be up to speed to get that job done by some, as compared to someone who's already in, who knows the systems, who knows the people, yes. who already build relationships. But on average, it's six months before you start, you get to that peak performance. Exactly, so before is, it starts trending. Exactly. So and the, it's, what guarantees them to stay even with that bonus? It's not guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, that that is uh, sad. But yeah, another question I had is, so we tapped into you know how how would new companies, startups? That's mo- mostly my audience right. here. Build mm-hmm. the right the right pillars to have a high performing team. Mm-hmm. We know, Mike uh, Simon Sinek. I don't know if you've seen that video about performance versus trust. Can you comment on that one? Or I can? Yeah. No, I no, we, we can comment. That. Yeah. We, so, without yeah. A doubt. yeah, so Simon Sinek, he had this video about um, the uh, SEAL teams, uh, Navy SEALs, and how they pick their, uh, you know, it's the, the elite team within uh, 
and how they pick those uh, individuals. So he had a couple uh, of X and Y, performance versus trust. And they'd rather pick somebody who has a lower performance and a higher trust as compared to high performer, low trust. So how important is it to kind of the trust factor in um, high performing teams? Look, look, in any, in life in general, in any organization, in mm -hmm. anything that goes on around us, there's two factors that I always consider for any mm -hmm. team that I try to build out. Number yeah. one, safe and trusted. Yeah. How safe do I feel around Nadia and how, tr how much trust do I have in Nadia? When I'm not looking, she has my back. So if, yeah. you, if you reference Simon Sinek and his Navy SEALs um, video, I've seen exactly what he goes about. He'll set the performance standards way up and yeah. he'll bring the SEAL team down here. But what is that he doesn't tell you or he tells you in between is I'd rather have a trusted person on my team than a performing person. Why? Very simple, because he knows that the trusted person will will be by his side or watch mm -hmm. his back during yeah. the troubles and tribulations as the performer is going to keep on going and leave you stranded yeah. at the end of the day. So when you build out a team, let's say for a startup, mm -hmm. make sure that from the onset, yeah. you let them understand that they have two things going on in this organization. It's mm -hmm. a safe and trusted place to work and that we yeah. are open and inclusive to any and all ideas and that you're coming here and we're all going to learn together to be able to generate or produce a great startup, energetic, motivated company from the get-go. That's, that's awesome. That's a simple way. I have a hundred different things I can tell you, but that's a simple way. That's great. Is there any tips how, like, let's say I'm a CEO and I'm setting up, you know, how to build trust within my team. Is there any activities or action items I should, I can do to build that trust within the team? Yeah, if, if it's a new employee or if it's with your current team, I think mm -hmm. the first thing the leader has to do is show his vulnerabilities like you and I had spoken about. Yep. Go out and share his story. Go out yeah. and let them know more about me. Know about Joe, what I've gone through, how I've gone through it, and share and open up and let them understand that, no, I'm a leader, but I'm a human mm -hmm. being just as you guys are, and I want to share my story and why I'm going to entrust my life in you to get us to where we want to go. Once I open up and I share everything, all my struggles, all my life, the team will be more cohesive and more understanding and they'll be more at ease with understanding where we want to go or the direction or the vision or the mission or the organization. That's great. Yeah. I, I also think that's a great point. I also think like that celebrating wins small mm -hmm. and big mm -hmm. in public yeah. builds yeah, trust that, you know, you've done your work and you lift the other people up without a doubt. Exactly. I think also like setting clear uh, expectations for everyone. So they're on the same level. Also removes that ambiguity, that that gray zone that could, you know, um, feed into that uncertainty or not trusting. Right. Not right. only the leader, but between team members, too. Like you said, clarity is key in any part of a team building, in any part of organization. Clarity mm -hmm. is key because you must define and you must be clear about your expectations with everybody on the team. Because if not, you're just going to have everybody crossing over and, and exchanging or interchanging when they're not supposed to. So clarity is a huge component. It's part of yeah. the seven C's program on mm -hmm. team building. Yeah. And those are the things that you have to be clear on. Like, like I said, look, teams is, is something that I'm passionate about. Because yeah. I have walked in, and we spoke about this earlier, and I've seen team members that have been disengaged and passed over by this extrovert person that thinks that they have all the answers and everything. Yeah. And to me, that's completely um, unacceptable when we talk about a team environment because Nadia yeah. has the same seat at the table as Joseph, and mm -hmm. let's bring it all together. Let's not think that just because you have a title or position or you make X yeah. amount of compensation, you're a mm -hmm. superior being over Joe. That's not going to happen. Not under my watch, that will never happen. Mm -hmm. Because about, I'm, I'm adamant. Yeah. How about the importance of psychological safety? Like, you know, that you can bring, what it's called, bring yourself to work, or at least, you know, be empowered enough and safe enough to share, you know, vulnerabilities, to share right. uh, not only wins, but failures. 
the tolerance of failure. And that's especially very important in startup work because the chances are you're working on something high tech or that has a higher chance of failure. How do you incorporate that culture that tolerates failure without being, you know, penalizing whoever fails as part of the process of making improvements? Well, for me, I never penalize anybody. To me, that's out of the question. To me, it's not about penalizing. To me, it's understanding that we're human beings, we're not perfect. I would say we more are. like not penalizing, but tolerance. I would, I would right. replace that for well, tolerance. You know why? When, when teams, we're all individuals. The first thing that the leader in the organization has to understand, number one, we're all individuals. Number two, we're never going to be perfect. And number three, mm -hmm. we're human beings just like everybody else. So we're prone to yeah. make mistakes. Whoever can tell me that they've never made a mistake, do that. You're, they you're, didn't you're try. One, they didn't do they anything. They didn't try, or you're one heck of a guy that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Because I use me as a reference. I'm the most perfectly imperfect human being on this planet. Because I, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am without being Yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes, myself. and you learn from them. Yeah. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna continue to make them because that's human nature. When I stop making mistakes, it's what you said. I stop trying. I'm Just never gonna stop going, trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm always gonna look for a way to get ahead, to empower everybody to make sure that we get together and to make sure that we be, be the best version of ourselves. But mm -hmm. going back to the original question, I open up myself that I'm the most imperfect person in the world. I've made mistakes. I understand mm -hmm. we're going to make mistakes, but in no way, shape or form do I want anybody to think that it's a setback on the contrary. It's something yeah. that I want everybody to bring to the table. Let's research it. Let's look at it. Let's see how we can make it better and gain our win from that yeah so-called loss because now we've mm -hmm. learned what we can do the next time to make it better so it's awesome. either a learning ex a, a learning environment or a winning environment there's no losses or there's no penalization or no uh no anything that has to do with a negative whatever i feel didn't go as planned we'll address it in a positive tone and we'll mm -hmm. turn it into a learned experience or a winning experience yeah that's what i do and yeah, if I may add, in terms of, especially for innovative departments, for example, or um, departments that do a lot of piloting that have a higher chances of, you know, learning curve, I think it's also important to have metrics, evaluation metrics that of are course. different for different teams. So if it's a sales team, maybe it's on their, you know, sales, if it's in marketing on their you know uh, traffic or what have you and how many ads have click rate and what and things like that correct but having clear evaluation processes for different departments or team members is key mm -hmm. because you right. cannot put everyone in the same standardized you know evaluation form right you know that's the comparison syndrome that i tell everybody you can't compare joseph to nadia i can never be nadia you can't compare Nadia to Joseph. Nadia will never mm -hmm. be Joseph. And you know that when when we set unrealistic expectations of the teams that we're that we're trying to build out, what have mm -hmm. we just done? We just set ourselves up to, uh, to not be successful. Yeah. So, the, what what are the, what is the? And I'm I'm sure you know this better than probably I do. In a startup, what are the expectations of a startup, and how long will it take before that startup even considers being at the higher rate? Because most startups fail in how long? In a couple of years. If, yeah. if maybe even shorter than that. 95%, yeah. Exactly. So what does that tell you? You have to make sure that you have everything. Everything must be measurable. Because yeah. if it's not measurable, there's you nothing going to happen. It. Yeah. You what I don't it. want. Yeah. What I don't want to happen is you measure me against Nadia or measure Nadia against mm -hmm. me. What I want to be able to do is set ourselves up for success by measuring what we have setting our clear expectations of what we're trying to achieve and then yep. go out and try to make it happen. Yeah. And in terms of, um, you touched on a great point that you have to have a, a way to measure things over time. Yeah. That leads me back to a book I read recently. It's called uh, CEO Excellence. It, it's by McKinsey uh, Company, the consulting company. And they looked at thousands of the highest performing CEOs over a period of 20 years. And they found that one of the six criteria that makes them way above the rest is that they take 
soft skills mm -hmm. as hard skills, and they measure them across the organization over time. Right. So, and I thought it was eye-opening because we measure a lot of KPIs, key performance indicators, right. and the numbers, but not the soft skills part. And I saw that a lot in highly technical jobs. Right. As we say that what gets rewarded gets done. So mm -hmm. over their years and years of training, they get rewarded on their technical performance. And right. of course, the soft skills takes a backseat. And then you get to the tier environment, to the real world, and then you have you see a differential between the leadership yeah. and the technical stuff, uh, the technical skills uh, gap. Gap between their technical and leadership. And that's where a lot of technical people struggle. So yeah. what do you recommend if you are hiring a high-performing technical person to support them on the other areas that they may need? Well, it depends on what they need. Um, the soft skills, to me, that's what's, that's what's big now. Because it's over, like we've spoken about, it's, it's for people now. And we can, I, I know hard skills. I can drive mm -hmm. you. I can, I can get you honed in. I can take you to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. But the good mornings, the how you doing? Hey, it's great seeing you. The softer skills to get more people involved is what mm -hmm. a lot of people are struggling with for X amount of reasons. And that's in most organizations. Everybody, most people can learn their hard skills. Yeah. But a lot of folks have a, have a hard tendency to bring on their soft skills because of vulnerability, insecurities, uncertainty uh, for X, Y, Z reasons. So I've always, my hiring, I'll go just to go a little bit back, my hiring, I'll hire attitude over skill set every single day. Because if I have a gentleman that's polite or a lady that's polite and they understand how to treat people and they're open with learning and they're open to do everything, that's fine. I can teach skill. I can't teach attitude. And the soft skills come come in when you get a person that understands who they are as an individual. Yeah. The first mm -hmm. concept, you have to get to know yourself to be able to mm -hmm. share your soft skills with everybody else. Those are some of the basic things that I look for. Okay, great. Yeah, I would I think like in terms of if it's a general not lower skill level that is trainable, yes, that, that's the case. But if it's right. somebody right. like advanced degrees or advanced programming right. or advanced surgeon or in the healthcare space it's very very technical that, you different. cannot it's teach different. and right. i think for those what what uh, employers should consider is to complement that because it takes right. it costs them way more having turnaround in a healthcare professional as compared to getting them matching them with a senior level person who can right. you know mentor them or coach them or be their, you know, go-to person if it's for anything that is non-technical on the soft right. side, on the managerial you know, side. Right. You know what I found, and I'm sure you've walked into emergency rooms and hospitals, correct? Mm -hmm. And them nurses, them doctors, them, them folks that are on 24 hours a day. Yeah. Most of them people don't last too long. They're great at what they do, but they're mm -hmm. so honed in on that constant going 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 emergency from here to here that they lose their soft skills whatsoever and, mm -hmm. and eventually they get burnt out and they have and to they leave, leave and they leave yeah and the, mental health. burnout is a real problem in uh, right. in healthcare and retention right. also oh, that, that's is what a it is it's huge. and i really exactly. think being having an mba in healthcare i really think that if there are any healthcare you know leaders out there that it's more cost effective for a, a healthcare system to get as part of their package if they are hiring a very highly skilled person as part of their offering give right. them a coach right a coach and not that only they can reach out to for the right. things that they cannot talk to to their colleagues or to their supervisor or to their you know leaders within the organization Right. Exactly. Because as we know, not everybody wants to open up to everybody. Yeah. So they have to have an out. And if they exactly. don't provide an out and, and what I've known and, and, and worked with nurses, hmm, dude, they're struggling. Nurses they are that are out, out there. Yeah. 
-hmm. They're just showing up because they need the money. But when they leave, it's like, wow, the whole world is caving in on them. And to mm -hmm. me, that's a disservice to our our people that are putting their lives on the line to serve Absolutely. us. Absolutely, yeah, and that that's, goes not that's only, terrible. yeah, not only for physicians but nurses too. Right, so exactly. Because it costs. Let me give you an example. Let's say a scenario: there was like a, a highly skilled physician, and for some reason, for burnout or what have you, they leave. Mm -hmm. It's going to take at least six to eight months to replace you that. You hit physician. it right on. You hit it right on. And not only that, once they are hired, add to that another three to six months, depending on the specialty, before they get up and running with the recruiting new patients and having, you know, a well-oiled machine in terms of having enough patients and so on, to be up to speed with the income that the organization expects. It will cost way less for them to be matched with a senior person, or even to pay for a person, one-on-one -on -one coach for that particular person. I'm going to tell you my suggestion to the healthcare field that's encountering that right now. From day one, that they hire a nurse, a physician, whoever they hire, mm -hmm. also bring on or have someone to start coaching them from the first day first they day. start the organization. From the first exactly. day, because that's, that's going to start preparing them. And maybe mm -hmm. avoid the stress, the anxiety, and the burnout. Because even though they leave in six months, you know what they haven't left? What's caused their mind to do after the six months of being stressed out? Because exactly. now they might encounter because their mental really health. Right. Not only exactly. on them and their families. Yeah, on everybody. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Because for me, it's the least of my concerns. What's going to happen to my family when mm -hmm. I now have to go through all these situations that I have to encounter? That's going exactly. to take a toll on them. So I destroyed mm -hmm. the whole family yeah. just because I didn't do one thing. Exactly. So, you know, healthcare leaders out there, perhaps it's mm -hmm. time to incorporate the coaching, the leadership coaching as part of the physician and nurses hiring. And yeah, because I think the return on investment is huge. Um, huge. Yeah. Compared to and, the turnaround and, time. What I like to tell everybody, the return on investment, on investment, I add a P between the O and the I. It's mm -hmm. not your return on investment. It's the return on people investment. People Invest the money in your people. people. Exactly. It's about the people, not, not, the, uh, not the metrics. You know, the, exactly. Uh, the Numbers revenue. are great. Numbers are great, but people are better. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I think, yeah, that coaching and mentoring is, is very important. Um, because the first, you mentioned like from day one, mm -hmm. the first touch point of, you know, a new hire or a new recruit is, an, is a, a reflection of the organization culture. Of course, of course. Because of course. if you hire somebody and then your onboarding is not up to par, it's a, it's a good indicator that you may be having have a, a problem. And people sense that. And you don't want, after spending months to, you know, interview and hire, to miss that chance to make a good impression from the get-go. So they say. Right. Listen, anybody that has an MBA or a PhD like you in the medical field that walks into an organization, from the moment you walk in, you already know what's going on in that organization. Exactly. Nobody can fool you, Nadia. So when you want the right people in your organization, treat them exactly how mm -hmm. they must be treated from day one. Don't wait mm -hmm. six months later to tell them, oh, well, now you brought up that you're not feeling good. Now we're going to work with you. No, now it's too late. From exactly. Day one. There was, yeah. Without naming which hospital system that is, <laughs> there was like a, um, a turnaround situation in a famous hospital system. And when the new CEO came in, he did like a, a 360 across all levels. And he right. noticed that that first touch point when a patient come to the, the healthcare system was the parking. Mm -hmm. Because exactly. if somebody, think about somebody in distress, he's trying or she's trying to take their kid to the emergency room and they get to the parking and then they spend another 15 minutes try to, to park. He changed even like the designation that everyone is a healthcare provider. Of they course. got a lot of pushback from physicians and nurses. How could you put like, you know, a janitor at the same level as a, a, um, a doctor? 
But the vision was that that janitor who's cleaning the hallways or the emergent or the uh, the ORs and so on, they right. know that they are contributing to the healthcare and the service by reducing the rate of infections. Of course. The parking the parking lot clerk, they know that by taking those keys so the person can hop in to take their kid to the emergency room, saving them 10 minutes or 15 minutes of stress is super valuable right. to the experience. And by doing that, to take the journey, make that journey seamless and that experience worth it, they became one of the top healthcare systems in the country. That's it. Every, every opportunity that you get to turn whatever we're trying to turn into an experience for each individual, it's a yeah. completely different effect on the individual than just a job or a position or a title. Yeah. Let's, let's create experiences for everybody where they come out and understand that this is, this is you. This is really you, and we're going to provide you with everything you need exactly. to, to flourish, to grow, and to be, have a seat at the table. That's so the experience awesome. is key. Mm -hmm. That takes me to one example about somebody who was building like bricks in uh in the, like a um a builder and there were three three of them the first one was asked what are you doing he's like i'm cutting bricks for a building the second one it was like i'm building you know a church it was like you know a community place and the third one he was like i'm building a, a building like i'm building a structure that right. is going to be a hub for the community so you see they are all doing the exact same job you know cutting bricks for a building but knowing your why that big vision why you're doing what you're doing what are you contributing to really right. makes a difference well that's that it'll bring me to a lot of other things but that's where your passion mm -hmm. and your compassion comes into what you love to do to me, it's to serve. That's my mm -hmm. goal in life is to serve and to bring equality to all because I cannot accept my parents migrated from another country here and I cannot accept what they went through no longer. I'm not going to do it. So mm -hmm. I'll stand up for anybody and everybody. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring it every day. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's I'm looking me. for your timeline. I love it. I, I'm a people person. I love to serve. And that's what mm -hmm. I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to serving and helping everybody out. And along with that, optimizing mm -hmm. the line, high-performing teams and letting everybody understand that they're equally as important as me or anybody else on this planet. That is awesome. I have a friend of mine who's joined here, Valeria Green, okay. and she has a hey. question for you. Hi, Nadia. Does, uh, does um, Joseph uh, consult startup founders on how to, better, to be a better leader and how to expand their team? That is my specialty, Valeria. You can reach out to me here. Um, get a hold of Nadia. She can guide you to where I am. And we can do even better. Valeria, here is his, uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph's uh, email, joseph at inthegamegroup.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to him uh, with your questions. Yes, and we please have... do. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I will definitely jump on a quick uh, introduction call, and I'll give you my ideas. Um my whatever else you need from me and we can get it we can get it started at no charge complimentary call reach out to me i'm easy to get a hold of and, and we can go from there and valeria i can tell you joseph is awesome so i'm we just have a regular another, joe nadia <laughs> another comment here uh, by uh, narish malik uh, my mantra of building high performance team is keep people interested keep people informed keep people involved and keep them inspired any comments those are those are cr great 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 four pillars of building teams and the chances of sustainability if you continue to practice that way are huge and i i i, I i'm glad you're doing that because to me those are important as could be great great awesome. great way to build teams that's great and um you have also from narish building high performance team is always a challenge um, life is a challenge in itself exactly exactly we, uh, thank you for stopping by zahra and uh yeah she said thank you for sharing these valuable tips and awesome. information yeah valeria feel free um to reach out uh, so yeah to reach out to get in touch with uh, joseph and all the best to you 
And Valeria has a platform for a marketplace for fashion designers that are oh, awesome. underrepresented so they can sell their fashion on her platform. So, yeah, if she wants, she can connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll respond right away. And I'll send, uh, I'll send her my uh, lovely video that I send to everybody. No, absolutely absolutely yeah and uh, if you have for the audience if you have any um, questions or comments and if you're watching this sure. on the recorded session feel free to put it in a comment with, or reach out to either joseph or all your needs that are related to team building or mm -hmm. optimizing existing teams and mm -hmm. uh, on my end i help move tech to the market in the healthcare tech space. There are a couple of things I'm very uh, actively working on to help entrepreneurs in that space. One of them is a membership for women entrepreneurs in the healthcare tech space. Why is that? Because there are so few women in the tech field and the ones that are in the tech field only receive 2% funding from VCs. Despite being responsible of over 80% purchasing power in the healthcare tech space. So there is a huge differential. And I think by empowering women to solve problems for 50% of the population, there is a right. huge opportunity there. And I wanted to offer something that is continuous. There are opportunities out there for sh short training programs, three months here, three months there for equity. This one is continuous without taking equity in your company. So if you are interested in that, reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn. And uh, any final words, Joseph? Yeah, this is aside from team building. Um, as far as people, remember, there's three or four things that I like to tell everybody that they must live by every day that I think will change the trajectory of their life. And it'll, be the, and it'll bring their best version every day. It's number one, believe in yourself. Yep. Number two, value yourself. Number three, create yourself. If number four, recreate yourself. Never, never, never let anybody talk you down or think that they have an upper hand on you, whether they have a title or position or any compensation. Because at the end of the day, if you don't believe and value yourself, nobody will. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you're from, if you're from, if you're not from who you are, who you're not, always, always, always understand that you're just as good as a human being than anybody else, no matter what anybody tells you. That is awesome. And, I love it. And I, I like to offer a little free gift to whoever wants to jump on. 30-minute free consultation call with me. And you might have a lot of fun, so that's the drawback. And we can definitely get together and discuss any and all topics that you'd like to discuss. My that's information awesome. there and Joseph Gonzalez on LinkedIn or Joseph at in the game group com, like Nadia's posting on the banner. And I want to thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for everything that you offer me. And let's grow this world together and make it a Absolutely. kinder and better place for all. That's great. And if you guys are not following Joseph, I highly recommend uh, following him on LinkedIn for Whoa. his advice and his <laughs> motivational short videos that will get your day started. I really look forward to those every day. And uh, I'm a huge, uh, huge fan. Thank you so much, Joseph, for your time. It was super valuable. And uh, yeah, feel free if you have any needs for team building to reach out to Joseph. He's 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 the guy. He's your guy for this. Thank you. Have a fantastic day, Nadia. Thank, Thank you. you very Thanks much. everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.